Has the market changed its mind about what the Fed may do next? We have got to get inflation behind us. I wish there were a painless way to do that. There isn't. I think this is a two-part policy mistake of historic proportion. I think the odds of a recession in 2023 are very high. I think you'd offer the American people an apology. Welcome. I'm Christopher Crystal with Financial Stockholm. Uh, today is Tuesday, October 4th. And uh, these are the views that we see in the markets in Sweden or Scandinavia in general. Uh, the top news in the Swedish press is still about the economy and uh, the effects of the Ukrainian war that we're suffering here in Europe and uh, what we look forward, uh, what we can see in front of us. You still have the, uh, the investigation ongoing into Nord Stream 1 and 2. Uh, we've had some further gas coming out of it. Uh, so it's not entirely empty or it hasn't been entirely empty. Uh, but uh, the likelihood of that working in the future is gone. And um, so it lies behind the scenes of who did this and why. Uh, the speculation isn't really what's important about who actually did it, if it, was the, if it was Russia, if it was the United States, if it was China, if it was a European actor. The point is, is that this is driving closer to a European war. And uh, the rhetoric on the war is at an extreme level. Uh, where you're, you're seeing Putin has made it very clear about nuclear, and uh, you have comments back from European uh, agencies and ministers discussing nuclear. You have from the United States a uh, discussion of nuclear as well. And uh, that is not good for us here in Europe. It's not good for the world. If uh, people want to think about ESG, this would be the worst environmental disaster we've seen in the history that we know. And uh, this would wipe out a lot of things, uh, including prospects. Um, so really what would be nice to see is a discussion about peace and how to get there and what we could do to achieve it. Uh, this is not being uh, discussed yet, and it makes it even worse when you see Russia moving their largest atomic sub and happens to be the largest atomic sub in the world in the Arctic Sea. They're repositioning it and they're moving their supply logistic train for it. There, uh, there's a discussion about what they could be doing in the Black Sea or from the Arctic and uh, the missile range and so forth. And so it's really, uh, it's not good. Um, you do have a discussion starting in the United States, not just on uh, sides that are against Putin, uh, uh, Biden, but sides that are, um, would look neutrally in the past. So like Jeffrey Sachs, an economist professor over at Columbia University has discussed this with Bloomberg News. So you're starting to see some sort of leveling out of people talking about this. And that's really what we need. We need people to understand and discuss what's going on so we can avoid this disaster, uh, because this would be a showstopper for everybody involved. And that being, I don't know, eight, nine billion people in the world. Um, so maybe we ought to think about it. Um, so on the base of that, you know, gas prices long term will probably go up. Uh, we did see this morning that the gas price was initially down. Uh, and that's based on the reserve levels having been achieved faster than anticipated. So there's a lack of pressure to do that. So of course, supply demand, simple economics works here. And uh, we see a lowering from the high prices that we've seen. That doesn't mean we'll have low prices through the winter. It just means we're slightly lower than we are now. How does that translate through to the household? It's the economy and the electricity. What will be the electricity prices for business? and what will be the electricity, electricity prices for the household. Um, so that continues to weigh on the economy and uh, it does not look so good, but the beneficiaries for this would be, of course, the Middle East. Uh, Germany was over there. Italy is going to come into a need for gas as well because they had now all the Russian gas cut off that was going through uh, uh, with the, uh, from uh, Austria. And uh, then I would also say that um, we, what we look at next in the economy, and this is going to fuel the economy, is Credit Suisse and uh, what's happening there with their restructuring and their uh, liquidity. Uh, so we, we run into some issues there. Those have weighed on the Swedish banks uh, for several reasons. Uh, one of them would be the ESG because uh, Credit Suisse has been a major ESG funder. Um, you see them doing a lot of windmill projects, uh, a lot of solar projects, a lot of infrastructure deals, and uh, the time to make a profit on those to the investment cycle uh, is into question. 
And so what that means for this um, movement towards ESG is uncertain. Um, so what you see is a uh, possible stalling. Uh, Credit Suisse already had to postpone their green energy property fund, and um, they had already released that. And this is an example of what's happening to the market financially and financing drying up. So this is a, uh, another good reason why we need peace talks and need to get the economy going back uh, to a decent speed where we could see maybe a global GDP around 3%. Now, of course, around 3% and higher means higher oil prices, and that would be without OPEC cutting prices or cutting production to fuel price. We would see a natural gain in the oil price because of consumption need. Um, so who have been the beneficiaries right now on the gas? Well, China has been selling gas that they bought from the United States last year to Europe. They're selling at a nice profit. Uh, that's not enough to overall offset or increase their GDP overall, but it is a small bonus for those who are involved in it. Um, so what do we see here in uh, Europe? Well, companies like Pareto are talking about hydrogen. You can go to their website and you can find their podcast, episode number 62, to listen to what their thoughts on hydrogen. This is where a lot of the big money in Sweden has been involved. If you look at projects with names like Wallenberg and so forth, you see a lot of hydrogen generation and hydrogen as a source for achieving greenhouse emissions and investment and energy. Um, but also what we have in uh, Sweden would be our healthcare sector. We're going to get a positive sentiment benefit from Svante Pabo, who is uh, down at the Max Planck Institute, has been for years researching and doing work on DNA, uh, like the decoding of the Neanderthal, the human, and uh, looking at the impact of Neanderthal and Denisovan DNA in our current DNA structure and uh, helping trace and figure out migration routes in the past and uh, how we came to our civilization today. So that's positive for us which would also lead into a positive sentiment within the pharmaceuticals and pharmacology for gene-specific treatment of diseases. If you fit a genetic type, what you could use, and even if you came down to a singular level, singular level on an individual and having a specific treatment of a product. Um, so names that have been popular are BioArtic. Um, that's been a darling, especially because of the Alzheimer's treatment that they've released and the trials, or not they've released the uh, product yet, but the trials data has been released and it looks very positive. Um, we have a number of other names coming out like uh, Caladidas, uh, Hansa Bio, uh, Biopharma, and uh, Camarus. These are in the biopharma sector and would look to have continued benefit. Uh, we have seen that the wheat kroner is something that we don't necessarily like here in Sweden because the inflation is felt uh, and of greater impact for us. However, our large industrials can see a positive benefit. And therefore a recommendation is coming out from several different firms to go to defensive names. Um, and while you might not think that Volvo trucks or AB Volvo would be a beneficiary, they certainly are on the low kroner. So is Atlas Copco, uh, Electrolux and Sandvik, uh, Asa Abloy, which is a primary factor in LOX would certainly benefit. Um, so we do see a number of names coming out in those reports. And if you go to uh, any of the major banks, and I've listed all the links in the notes, uh, you can go to their research and find it, uh, what they're talking about with the Nordics. And overall, they're giving a dismal forecast and a cold winter. We're praying for a mild winter, so it won't be so cold and the cost won't be so high. But um, that's what we see here. The kroner doesn't look like it's going to strengthen anytime soon. We do have our government uh, forming a coalition government, so it's working in a transitory process right now. Uh, but the, the, they have till October 14th. And uh, we use a phrase here in Sweden, Sakta uh, Seker, which I think if you translate it to English, probably the best phrase would be slow is smooth, smooth is fast. And uh, if you're using that, you'll see how we're thinking here in Europe or in Sweden, Scandinavia. And uh, this is a general approach. Um, more bad news. Um, we do see that the uh, trend shopping in boutiques has declined for seven months. We know that already. Now we're seeing signs that the electronic shopping and online home delivery is starting to slow down. Some are saying that this is because of mass overpopulation to that sector, or you have a uh, uh, 
uh, mass effect where you're going to have lower and less names. Um, I don't know that that's bad, uh, but you do see a, um, an approach uh, coming where you'll have to see more efficiency. And, and on that, what I would note is we spoke with a company yesterday that's called NeoVici, and they are an AI company that does payment processing uh, for uh, receivables and payables. And they have a broad application for retailers and improving efficiencies, which you can see within a year's effect to their EBIT and their EPS. And that's not every time, uh, but it's generally, if you listen to the uh, interview, you can get a feeling for how they're doing with their Cosmo product. Um, and then uh, on the side also, that's a positive is Ski Star is uh, come out with good numbers this morning. Uh, the revenues increased as did their dividend as a result, or they've made the announcement that they will increase their dividend. So those who want dividends, especially foundations, will be looking at that stock. Some consider it to be an unstable revenue service or revenue stream for investment uh, because it's hard to gauge how they'll do in the winter. But now that they've added on the summer component to use their parks or slopes for the summertime, they seem to have been able to have figure out a successful business dynamic. Um, so that's going to be something. Um, you do have the Danske Bank report out this morning. And last night, uh, we saw a, uh, a move from the United Nations, or at least I saw it last night, where the United Nations is actually coming out and saying to the central banks, please stop raising rates, because although you want to achieve price stability, uh, we think it's going to hurt the overall population too much. Now, that's a great thought. However, in order to contain the inflation, which is the inflated money flow, you need to contain the money flow or draw it back in so you'll have less inflation. And that generally means by raising rates. What they want to do to achieve pricing stability would be to introduce price caps. Now, you can look through history and see how price caps have worked. It's not a viable means generally for price stability or economic stability. It generally has not worked. And uh, if you know of a case that has worked, please let us know. It'd be interesting to look at. But um, so it's really a choose your poison. Um, do you go through the short term pain or would you go through, in my opinion, what would be a long term pain and a long term death? Um, so they, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we're looking in Sweden for positives. Uh, we do see some positives, of course, in the names that I mentioned, or the sectors that I mentioned, we're not recommending any names, but in the sectors, you can look at those and, uh, you can look at the research from the banks that are producing it to get a better feel. And, um, with that, we'll wish you a great day and happy success in your investing. And, uh, we'll talk to you later and please Take a look at that NeoVici interview. It offers some valuable insight into the future of business and the speed of technology, therefore the speed of business. So thank you very much and have a great day. Bye. Hello, I'm Christopher Crystal with Financial Stockholm and welcome to our investor meeting. Today we have NeoVici, a Swedish AI company, which offers uh, improvement in operating expenditures, uh, as well as uh, offering you further developments within your payments, receivables, uh, helping companies from retailing to oil retailing. Uh, the, the gambit is uh, across the spectrum and uh, they offer the efficiency improvement. We've also invited in a company called FinTech Connector, which is located in New York and is a platform to bring together innovators within the FinTech world. So with that, we'll start with a short presentation from NeoVici, and uh, it will focus on their product, Cosmo, and we'll, we'll take it from there. Thank you very much, Jan. Great. This is a short presentation <clears throat> about what we are doing and, and the trends in the world. Um, our platform is cloud-based in, in uh, Azure, and we have, <clears throat> this is a platform that you could work, especially B2B, in a collaborative way. So we call it collaborative commerce. And uh, both in externally, you work with your coworkers or your suppliers and customers, of course. The, the trend, everybody knows about this. The, 
the COVID thing has done a lot of changes, uh, caused a lot of changes in the, the market. Every company around the world, that's our perception, they need, they, they actually are accelerating digital transformation. It's not only a good thing, nice to have it, it's a must. So the, working on distance, etc. And our focus has been so far with retail and telecom, but this applies to any industry. It's, it's really a must. You need to adapt to the changes and, and work more uh, for your co-workers to more, work more efficiently and also remotely. So, so you need to keep on, in, on track with your customers, with your consumers, whatever you name them. It's, it's necessary to change the technology. So what we see, the retail, let's say we, we could connect, it's also viable for the telecom and other industries. Again, it's, we, you need to see that this is changing so much. The, the process focused finance, as an example, is totally changing. You need to, let's say, accounts payable, accounts receivable as a start. It's, it's, it's really going to massive changes. So it's, for us, it's good. We, we have been working with this for a long time. And uh, now the timing is 100% right. The, the digital changes the way you think about uh, making a process like this so you can actually elevate and, and be more productive to look into the future instead of looking in the mirror and, and uh, report what ha has happened the last quarter, etc. Um, so for our company is Neovici, and we have again this platform Cosmos that is uh, an AI platform that works with smart algorithms. And, and uh, now I have a quote from a customer. They had every process was really painful. And now when they have joined us in, in this platform, they can actually act, accelerate every process. So it's a part, we help them with the digital transformation journey. And so to simplify it, we, we offer th the three Ps, increase the precision, take away the tolerance and be precise in every euro cent and also be compliant with your agreements with your customers or and your suppliers. The, <clears throat> the performance, the second P, you have everything in real time and you can actually increase the performance 10x. <clears throat> and of course, number three is maybe the most important. You will help the co-workers to work with uh, value-based, uh, you, you, you don't support the waste, you work with the value. And you can also be, use the system for augmentation. It's a lot of buzzwords, but it's, it's really, the, the goal is to keep the people happy, the, the humans, not to work with the boring stuff. They should work with, uh, again, value. So just to summarize this in, a, in some numbers, this is real business case that has pr proven time after time. And uh, we have this OPEX decline, 90% is not, I, I would say today we can reach 90% plus for any client, any process. And as I mentioned before, we have a 10 x faster performance, it could be 10x less people, or you get paid or will pay the suppliers in a more efficient way. Uh, and the precision, uh, 30 euros is not uncommon for big companies to have an error tolerance from, in the AP example, for, from the suppliers. And we decrease that to less than one euro cent per transaction. So it's it's a huge difference and it's about uh, leakage. You stop the leakage, Leak it, that's, uh, that's an important benefit. So thank you for that. This is again Cosmos.
the collaborative commerce platform. Okay, uh, thank you very much, John. Uh, for me, one of the points of interest is, of course, your AI technology and how you're developing this. Uh, obviously, I, I would think you have in-house engineers. And um, how are you developing this and protecting your uh, your your product so that not a, uh, nobody else can steal it or use it outside? What sort of uh, protection are you taking there? And would you have a patent or a patent pending on this? The secret source to have a technology with all the algorithms that is uh, we apply in, in this uh, processing world and. Uh, so what I can reveal today is that we have patent pendings and it's really important to secure things in, in what we are doing and not reveal too much of the secrets. But yeah, it's, it's a hot topic, it's a hot area and many companies are trying to steal from each other. I presume when, when they, you have something smart or copy, copy the things. So what we see, we have a, a time window of maybe three to five years that we need to keep ahead of the competition to work with uh, new ideas and new technologies and new algorithms. And again, patent them as well. So yeah, the, the, I mean, that's the, the main thing with the technology we have we can reach the level of 90, 98% of, of the, and when we say 98% of automation of a, a business flow, it's, it's, it's really a touchless. And what we have seen in competition, that they normally reach the level of 50 to 60%. So that's huge gap. And, and of course they are interested in what, how can we solve this in a way with still the same uh, data quality on the client side. So, so yeah, so that's a good question. It's really important to protect our IP. Okay. Okay. Uh, so Jan, with uh, 10 years experience in the field and development with customers globally, one of the questions I would ask is how fast can they see integration and improvement on the operating expenditures? Uh, generally, when people are adopting systems, it takes a while to learn and so forth. But I guess with AI, you don't have that issue. And uh, what would be the speed for the integration and then the results? Thank you. Question, I can give you one example. You have one of the big retailers we have now in Scandinavia. We, we started, they had an automation level of less than 50%, 45 something. And then when we started first month, we added up until 63% automation. And after one year, it was almost 90. So it's a, it's a journey. We need to help them to apply and also the algorithms are adaptive. So they learn by doing or, or this uh, machine learning, etc. So I would say in general, less then one year we could reach 90%. And the, the, uh, again, it's really important the, the level of quality from the client. Um, if they have perfect data, we can reach that 90 plus percent in the month. Jan, uh, one of my other uh, questions would be on the uh, base of customers and the, the applications you can see going forward across business spectrum. Uh, what other sorts of clients could you look for and uh, what other companies could you be working with? Uh, and what has the experience of working with uh, OKQ8 um, shown you and, and, and open up opportunities for you on if you're able to talk about that? Thank you. They also sell energy today. They, I mean, there's a mixture. This, uh, it's really, really interesting company because they have the gasoline stations and they are, <clears throat> in that sense, a copy of 7-Eleven. It's also client of ours in, in Scandinavia. And then you have uh, the electricity. You can buy electricity to your home from them. And they also have a bank. And they have a lot of food in, in the stores, they have 700 stores, so they're a retailer as well. 
So it's and for the, for us it's interesting because they started now what we start with them in the billing side. So it's accounts receivable, and that's uh, normally we start at the other end, but the platform connects to with every process. And one thing that's really interesting for us is that they have so many business to business clients. They have uh, more than eighty thousand. So that's uh, an, uh, an area where we hopefully are going to spread the Cosmos name. Yeah. Now those eighty thousand are they here in Sweden or uh, because I think they have some Q8 in um, Denmark in as well. Nor yeah, Denmark. Okay. Um, yes. So so how does it uh, how does your integration work between the countries and the different tax treaties and sending the information over to the accountants? Well, that's that's a tricky part, but we have solutions for that. You know, we we are already in Latin America. We have a, a telecom company in, in Mexico, so we have from the beginning set thinking and the setup is global. So we have uh, solutions for every difference in uh, almost any country, but uh, today in every country that we have clients. So yes, yeah, so that's uh, even in Scandinavia, it's a difference between Sweden, Norway, and Sweden, Denmark. And they, yeah. they do the accounting in different ways. They have a different VAT rules, etc. So we, we are experienced with that as well. Jan, if you don't mind me asking, um, as it relates to, you know, you're definitely in the retail telecom space. What Can you talk a little bit about your strategy potentially of entering into the financial services space, banking, insurance? Is that something in the horizon for you? Or um, if it's now, six months from now, a year, five years from now, if you could please elaborate on that? Yeah, the, <clears throat> a good question. The, the... New client we announced last week. Again, the, the conglomerate OK Q8 is, is uh, they have a bank and they also have a connection, strong connection to insurance. So uh, we have some ex earlier experience in that arena and uh, we, we love it because it's a lot of transactions. Yeah. So that is, I would say, within six months, we, we would uh, increase the presence in that field, especially in Latin, Latin America, and maybe hopefully in some other parts of the world. That's what I can reveal today. Understood. Because we are going to be listed this, this autumn, so we have a regulation I have to, we have to follow. But, uh, again, it, it's uh, the, the digitalization and automation is also happening in this space. It's, it's really interesting. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I would just, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, keep going, Jim. No, no it's, it's um, the more complex and the more transactions we have, the more efficiency, the more uh, benefits, the more, the faster our ROI for the client. So it's quite simple. We, and this is still in the beginning, in this era, we, we really need early adopters. Because so, so many companies are way behind. Let's talk about invoices as an example. Maybe you know this, but it's 2022, it's more than 500 billion invoices per year in the world, globally. And still we have 90% on paper. 90%. I mean, it, it has to be a big change in this area, even though Electronic invoicing has been around for more than 40 years. So I, I find it fascinating and a bit frustrating that we still have 90% on paper. Yeah, no, definitely seeing a big movement of that. I think that's a big area like in the invoice processing side where we're seeing kind of the automation now kind of saying, how do we take it from that paper invoice, the electronic invoices, and then garnering intelligence from uh, what we're seeing through that as well. I do have a question for you. Uh, um, one more follow-up question on the banking side, because, um, and I'm curious around your AI technology, as, as you might already be aware of, if not, you know, the regulators tend to, uh, you know, while they are, are pushing for more automation in the artificial intelligence space, 
it's always a black box. And I think regulators, at least within the banking and insurance space, uh, tend to um, be a little bit more reserved around that just because, because of the regulated nature of the industry, sometimes it's hard to have, it's hard to get insights into the actual engine uh, and, and kind of the way the AI works. How, how are you going to potentially, if you're making inroads into this industry, going to help alleviate some of those concerns? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting area because I would say today every company has this um, uh, anxiety a bit uh, that they worry about this uh, black box, as you mentioned, that what is going to happen. But so uh, today, an algorithm from in Cosmos that can kick away billions of dollars in one year without the human touching it. But what we provide to the clients is that they can have a sign off of every level of uh, automation and algorithms. So they can foresee what's going to happen and what impact it will have in their process. And, and secondly, there's a huge difference because now they can monitor in this automated way as well. In, let's say a bank, it's much more difficult to monitor what humans are doing. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, if we can educate them in the right way and offer the tools that we have in the system, in the platform for the management, they are actually satisfied and, and realize that this is a higher level of uh, compliance. That's, so that's, uh, yeah, that's my thinking of this okay. in this area. And sorry, one final question on your tool. Is Cosmos ready to be integrated into banks or do you need to do some level of customization uh, for the, the banking slash insurance clients? Well, the, the platform is two-folded, so to speak. It's a front-end tool yep. and, and the, then the back-end where all the secret algorithms are. Uh, we have an API possibility for the clients to do actually work themselves. But uh, it's, it's, uh, even if it's a new system needed to be integrated, we can use the library of APIs and um, exchange information. So it's, it's, not, it's really a straightforward job to, to integrate with a new platform, let's say in a bank, that has system X. If, so, and that we have done so many times, so it's, it's, it's uh, limited work, limited amount of work. All right, thank you. Back to, back to you, Chris. Good, good questions. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would add on the banking side is uh, I would think uh, Cosmos makes it easier with AML KYC uh, because, I mean, you know, you're, you're simply following a simple program, checking the documents, and then, then it can uh, link up to the other documents where they're originally from and so forth. So from my perspective, uh, I would think it's very easy with the Cosmos integration on AML KYC. Yeah, we, we automate that as well, actually. <laughs> and and uh, as you mentioned, we also keep track of every event in the system and every the journey of the items being a, a payment slip or, or a, a, a piece of uh, tomatoes. Uh, Every step on the, on the way, it's it's traceable, and it's so, so that's really important. It's um, sustainable and traceable. Yeah, and you can have a faster check. I mean, it's it's a digital trail, digital cookie trail, literally, right? That's so uh, you get an instantaneous uh, response of whether it's valid or not. Yes, and, and uh, the origin. This uh, I mean, in banking, where this uh, origin of the payment or the the money comes from, and the same in the food industry, it, it's more and more important to keep track of where is this meat, piece of meat coming from, which cow or the tomato, where is it grown? Today, uh, a good story is that you, you buy Italian, it's, the label is Italian tomatoes in, in, the, in the stores we have in Sweden, but it's grown in Holland. They send it to Italy first, but as a consumer, you want to know that it, it's uh, that part of the check origin check is, is really important, and that is also a bonus with the platform we have. 
we, we it, maybe you know that in our P system is every ground, everything is aggregated and you lose track of the transactions. But we keep every transaction, every event, as I mentioned before, every human interaction, every algorithm, what has been done. So it's easy for the auditors to see the, the history of every tomato, so to speak. Yeah, that's, that's a very clear trail. And then, um, well, that, that's uh, quite an array of businesses so far. So what's next? I mean, um, you know, actually, one of the questions I have about what's next is, are you speaking to these uh, payment processors that are doing the credit card transactions for individual retailers? With, is that another area or do you have relations with them? Yeah, we, I mean, we collect data or we have integration with different parts of the uh, payment providers. And, and we, when we do the matching, for example, we, we need to have information from the credit card transaction for, again, for OK, Q, Q8. And, and for 7-Eleven, there's a lot of no cash, no, almost no cash. It's all, all card transactions. And we need to connect that on the sales side and, and then in the end to the purchasing side. So yes, that's uh, part of our, our ecosystem. Yeah, because I, I would think that you'd be able to sell, a, sell some of your product, especially on the data management, to these guys like uh, Nets or um, uh, Worldwide. Uh, you'd be able to integrate very easily with them and offer them kind of a uh, reduction on their need, but yes. a benefit to their service. Well, I mean, we, we can then automate actually any process that's digital, and, uh, but we need to focus in, in some area. That, that if, therefore, we have this financial processing in, in uh, food, retail, and telecom. But now we are slowly expanding in, in uh, because we are hiring more people every month now. So we are on an expansion journey. Yeah, it's so that's uh, really I, exciting. But I think you'll as benefit. You mentioned, we, there's a lot of opportunities in different areas. Yeah, and I, I think you'll benefit from the, uh, the amount of uh, office space going available <laughs> in Stockholm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. That's fantastic. That's great to hear. Um, yeah. Uh, Overall, I mean, um, thank you very much. Um, I've really appreciated learning more. And, um, it, you know, it's always great to see a great company keep going. Thank you. So, so hopefully we see each other at the next press release. Yeah, I look forward to that one. That'll be a good one.